Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess to start with an introduction like that, you may wonder why I'm actually here presenting today, given I'm no longer part of the off-highway market or doing product development. And I think all of you realize it's about three hours from now until we'll be out on the yacht having dinner. And for an engineer from Columbus I mean, with cornfields and things like that, I just could not pass up that opportunity. Understanding the market. You see here several of the market themes that we focus on with incumbents to make sure we're developing the product that our customers need. Now, I imagine just about every one of you has a cell phone with you today. You may know that Motorola was the first to develop mobile handheld technology in April of 1973. There is the first telephone call from a mobile handheld device. Since that time, that market has focused on improving functionality within the phone, giving you iPhone, Samsung, everything you have today with all the capability that comes with it, improving performance while reducing the overall form factor and you know, reducing the size to what we have today. It is not unlike what we're trying to do within after treatment. There is one key difference, however, and that's everyone wants a cell phone. So again, with the market, these are what we see as the needs, and we're constantly trying to work to balance these because several of them can be competing as we go through. So what is our off-highway market? We have the three primary segments, construction, compact, and agriculture. And these could be anywhere from engines a 2.8 liter size up to 15, and each of those have their own unique challenges. If you just look at the picture and imagine where you can put an active treatment system on in each of those type of applications, there's a lot of variation that you'll see. You'll see differences in requirements, whether it's a agriculture application where you have a 200 degree C skin temperature requirement, if you're dealing with uh, safety of life at sea requirements, 180 degree skin temperature, a lot of variation and stuff to deal with. Within the HMLD realm that my group worked on, I, we were really focused on trying to maximize the performance and capability and minimize the variation despite all the different duty cycles and applications that we had to try to work through. A very brief history of after treatment from CES. Pretty much over the last 10 years, we have in introduced several different architectures into the global market. You know, the first launch we really had was the 2006 SCR product for Euro 4. We introduced DOC and DPF to North America as part of EPA 07. And the primary architecture I'm going to be highlighting today as we talk through um, the stage five is the DOC DPF SCR architecture. That is the chosen architecture we're moving forward with. It was first introduced within North America for 2010. And you can see the implementation for off-highway was part of tier four final on our 12 and 15 liter engines in the 2014 timeframe. So a lot of experience and things to build on with our modular switchback product going towards where we are today. You may have seen in the presentations earlier from the Balma Press announcements that one of the key changes that Cummins is making for stage five is actually the removal of EGR from most of the engine family. The 3.8 liter up through 12 will not have EGR. The X15 will maintain EGR uh, like the tier four final product. So those new non-EGR engines are gonna be matched with what we consider our latest technology offering and that's the single module after treatment. So it takes that base architecture, DOC, DPF, SCR, that we know so well, and applies new technologies in mixing, inlet-outlet design, catalyst technologies to try to reduce that size into a single module package. This is being introduced into the North American on-highway market kind of as we speak for EPA 2017, and then we'll be introducing this in the 2019-2020 timeframe depending on the engine displacements and ratings for stage five. So what is needed for stage five? Obviously, particulate number, PN reduction is the key regulatory driver um, from a development perspective. And really, that's what's enforcing the inclusion of a DPF onto the product. 
we look at our tier four final product, um, you know, our mid-range programs and light duty programs are gonna be primarily DOC and SCR product. We did introduce a DOC DPF SCR within tier four final for Switzerland, Germany, Austria as part of their particulate requirements. Um, but fundamentally, this is the, the key driver to do a, a change for stage five. Now with that, and again, you'll hear me talking a lot about EGR and, and the impact to us, that has driven a need to have much better performance from our product. The reduction efficiencies are much higher and that can be counterproductive or counteractive to the desire of our customers to have a smaller space claim and a smaller product. So it's PN reduction, improved performance, all in a smaller package. The chart shows the three different technologies that we basically evaluated for stage five. The leftmost, the baseline was basically taking our tier four final design and just porting that into our stage five product offering and working with those customers. The middle was looking at a technology with an SCR coding on the filter, so SCRF, and our the single module design that we're gonna go forward with is on the far right. And I'll be talking through how we've chosen single module, how it impacts those five key challenges that you see in that table you know, as we go through. Now a single module, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the enablers having advanced catalysts and coding technology, compact mixing, optimizing the urea injection system with UL2 and the compact mixer technology to go from you know, a one meter decomp reactor pipe into a smaller compact mixer, the inlet and outlet designs to try to minimize their size while reducing back pressure as much as possible or minimizing it. And you know, the last piece that's not really covered here is the importance of the engine and after treatment integration, that having a very strong tie-in with the engine team and how the system is calibrated and functioning and how everything is sized to work in unison. So to start with the first key challenge, PN reduction. This was the one that again drove the addition of the DPF and was a little bit of a surprise that it turned out to be a challenge. With our Euro 6 offering that has DPF technology, we've been able to certify all of our product to meet PN. We were surprised initially that with the no EGR system, if you have high NOx, low PM, higher temperatures, it keeps the filter very, very clean and makes it harder uh, to get to the levels necessary to meet the PN requirements. So if you think through the basic mechanisms for filtration, you have diffusion, interception, and inertia. The smallest particles through Brownian diffusion are kind of captured. I just like to think that there are small particles that get attracted to the wall and get captured that way. Interception and inertia are really used to capture the largest particles. You know, the particles are much larger than the pore, so it'll go through and get captured, or you just simply can't move through the pore and get past the filter without getting caught. This really leaves us with a challenge, and that's the medium-sized particles around 100 nanometers. These are the particles that if you have a brand new filter, you put it out there, those will go right through the pore and add, and you'll have that as you know, measurable particulate. The challenge then becomes, how do you design the DPF and choose how it operates to try to minimize the, the particulate coming out of the system? With the low PM, high temperature system, that means we run very, very clean. There's hardly ever any amount of soot that is in the system. So historically, you may be able to say you would use a soot layer, a soot cake, and use it to basically effectively reduce the size of the pores and help with filtration, but we can't rely on that here. You can obviously reduce the you know, mean pore size with the material and restrict it so much that you get good reduction. If you're using a no EGR based system, or even if you're not, you know, back pressure is something that you cannot mess with. You have to have that as low as possible, so you really have to try to balance that. So that really leaves you with trying to use kind of the best balance of the design technology that's there and operate with the knowledge that you need to have some type of ash layer formed in that DPF to help with filtration. So the table on the right-hand side 
This shows an example of different catalyst technologies that we had tested. And you can see over time how the PN count coming out of those has been lowered. And that impact is from ash forming on the filter and being maintained. NOx reduction, I guess, is another one I could say that maybe stuck up, snuck up on us a little bit. We had planned originally to have an EGR-based system. The NOx levels for stage five weren't changing, so it should have been fairly straightforward to just drop in the same system and have it function. You know, with engine team cranking up engine out NOx, that means we had to get a lot more efficiency out of the SCR system. The first response to that is obviously taking the catalyst volume and increasing that volume to match the performance need kind of out of the box. With the higher temperatures, however, we would see more aging in the product. So not only did we have to increase the size for the initial efficiency improvements, but we also had to look at sizing appropriately over the life of the product to ensure we're meeting emissions at end of useful life with much more aggressive temperature profiles that we're seeing in the system. The other element that this obviously impacts when you go to a high NOx engine is dosing rates. I didn't say much about it, but on the particulate count, dosing can have an impact on your downstream PN, so more dosing can impact that. But the biggest challenge from a NOx reduction perspective is if you're pushing the dosing system, the decomposition subsystem, harder and harder to try to meet those high efficiencies, it can lead you to duty cycles and conditions where you could form deposits. So you need to have the ability to help mitigate deposit make and to be able to clean out any deposits of form. It's really about optimizing the design of that mixer, the dosing system, and the whole strategy, how you do that. But those are all challenges and things that came about as we moved to a no EGR system. And unfortunately, with all of these having an impact in some way on the size of the product, that means that one of our key challenges later is talking through how that size impacts the customer base and how to minimize that. Seems whenever somebody thinks about a DPF system, they immediately jump and start thinking about regeneration. So I think what is regeneration is basically cleaning out soot in the filter is the simple way people think about it. So you could be doing O2-based regeneration going up above 500 degrees Celsius to remove soot, or you could be doing a passive cleaning using high NOx, low PM, you know, 250 to, to 500 degrees to keep the filter clean. De-soot is not the only reason that regeneration does exist on the product. It's the primary reason, but in the case of a no EGR solution, we really don't need to do a regeneration to clean soot out of the product. That's just not a concern. So where we may have a need is with sulfur, so desulfation. So if we're using a higher sulfur fuel, you have that collecting in the SCR, so you'll have to raise temperatures of the overall system, and we do that through regeneration. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about deposit make. A regeneration is the primary means to clean out a deposit. If it could be a low temperature deposit that may burn out at 150, 200 degrees. If it's you know, just liquid urea, if it's biurate, if it's cyanuric acid, you may need to go up you know, close to a, an active regen type condition. It's a little lesser known hydrocarbon desorb, um, water accumulation in the system. Those are also things that Regenerations of some types can be used uh, to help mitigate. With that said, regeneration has been a part, at least of my life since I joined in 2004, is actually the first set of controls algorithms that I was working on as an engineer. And those 10 years, you can see our basic tuning strategy kind of described here of how we started a very conservative approach on our 2007 product, where we're really focusing on maximizing the life of the filter. So you do very long, deep regenerations at lower temperatures. You try to limit thermal gradients, limit stress on the filter to make it live. As we've gained experience in the market, as technologies have improved, we've been able to become a lot more aggressive in how we do 
regenerations, how we control those, and how we help tie those into the overall performance of the product. You know, so a regeneration now, again, for a DSO, we won't be doing any type of regens at all. But if we do do a regen, it would be quick, higher temperature, and it would have the same kind of responsiveness as we used to have when we were very conservative and very new to DPF regenerations. Obviously, the byproduct of regenerations, if you're talking about an active regeneration above 500 degrees, how do you mitigate temperatures in the exhaust stream coming out the tailpipe? Do you use a diffuser? How do you direct flow out of that? How do you insulate the product? You know, if, again, if it's an agricultural application, you can't have a skin temperature at 350 degrees C in an insulated area. Actually, the little chart here, this is a single module showing you know, temperature profile during a regeneration event, and we have areas that are very well insulated that are cooler and areas that don't have as much insulation that show up as kind of hot spots. And depending on the application, the market, and the need, you may need to put additional internal insulation, add external insulation, the heat shield, or something like that to help mitigate those temperatures. With back pressure, I have to admit, there was one project, one time, and I'll always remember this because it's very unique, having an engine TPL come to me and say he needs me to increase the back pressure in the after treatment system. It's never going to happen again, but that one time was to try to reduce variation that we're seeing between configurations. So he had a very good reason for it, but it's something that you never hear when it comes to being downstream of the engine trying to increase back pressure. Back pressure was one of the primary reasons that we decided to stick with a traditional DPF technology over SCRF. You can see the example CFD, that is obviously not the single module, just showing the cutouts of where we had section and look at back pressure going through the system. The two uh, tables on the right-hand side do show a relative comparison between the two technologies with the box around the DPF versus SCRF. So compared to our targets, we just simply could not handle the additional back pressure that we're going to be seeing from the same size system with an SCRF coating. The size reduction benefits of, you know, one, one and a half, two inches just could not outweigh the back pressure penalty that we were going to be seeing. I guess the other aspect and kind of the final piece looking at impact to customers. And if you think through, you know, if no one wants a system, what can you try to do to make it as less obtrusive and a pain for them as possible? And that's to make it smaller. The picture shows the tier four final switchback compared to the single module. And if you look, if you have an EGR system, with a switchback versus an EGR with a single module, you'll see a noticeable decrease in size between the two. When you take EGR off, you end up losing some of that size again back to try to maintain performance and get the higher performance that's necessary with a no EGR system. We think through how to define the target size. Seen on the 3.8 liter, I think maybe the 4.5 we're looking at engine mounting options, so you could have an engine mount or a chassis mount. You go into the larger sizes, we're exclusively chassis mounting. But we need to be able to develop a product that can live in both. Uh, higher vibration uh, frequencies that we see on engine mounting or chassis versus chassis. We look at the space claims. Obviously, one of the challenges if you're developing technologies three to five years out, our customers haven't developed any of their their new chassis application. So how do we determine how to size it, what type of application options we need, what type of flexibility needs to be there? You know, do we look at competitor after treatment systems and how they've sized their product and where they fit? Do we just use our existing space claims that we had from tier four final? You know, do we look at specific types of equipment and try to identify the fit that's necessary in that type of market? It ends up really being all three of those and you know it kind of doing the best that you can to identify what those requirements need to be, knowing that most likely they're going to change once the customers start to develop um, 
their systems in detail. Um, on this, I will highlight on some of the design parameters, the installation flexibility is something that is critical when you work across multiple markets and different segments, all the different types of applications. So having the op options to change the clocking, change location, the sensor tables. In fact, um, you'll actually see a description of a flex module, and that's basically a single module that has been um, modularized to function in a way similar to switchback. You know, and the primary reason for that is with taking that system and trying to get it to work on all the different customer applications that we need to, we needed to have that flexibility to modify it where it made sense to. And through all of that, we need to try to maintain the performance with the flexibility, with the size, and make sure those are as balanced as possible. So again, if we look, our solution, I said, was to, to go from a switchback to the single module using a standard DPF substrate. There are many challenges that we've seen that come with stage five, particulate account being the primary driver from a regulatory perspective. Um, but again, for us, the biggest challenge is actually self-imposed by removing uh, EGR from the system. Really good for a customer base, but it makes it a lot harder on, on the after treatment engineers um, to get the product developed. So to conclude, it never feels good to not be wanted. However, there does a definite sense of satisfaction to know you're needed. Thank you very much. <laughs>